thanks everybody for coming tonight. My name is Dan Boron, I'm the community planner for the city of Springboro, along with my colleague here, Nan Allen, from the Springboro Public Library. Um, we've been partnering on this program now for seven years, I believe. So I want to thank you all for coming tonight for the program. Before we introduce Justin, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our program, what's left for the year, and some other um, housekeeping. Please turn off your phones. This is being recorded for eventual rebroadcast on the City of Springboro website and also through MVCC. I want to thank also Miami Valley Cable Council for uh, filming tonight, Joe, and then uh, Jason Vogel back there uh, doing the light and the sound as well. So thank you everybody and also of course Maureen for organizing a lot of this tonight. I really appreciate that. Uh, we're going to ask for a couple things. Um, Justin will be cool with having questions during the session, so please um, just yell them out. We may ask for them to be repeated so that they can be heard on the, uh, on the recording here for later rebroadcast. Thanks, everybody's bringing their wheels, that's awesome. And um, also uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the remainder of our programming. We have two more slots available. Please get one of the cards here for the next destination speaker series. Our remaining programming will be here in this room. We'll have Steve Magus, who I think you've all seen before. He'll be talking a little bit of bike law, a little bit of bike history, very fun speaker. He will be here on Monday, February 6th. And last but not least, we're bringing back Jocelyn Hardman, who uh, is a instructor at Central State University, excuse me, Wilmington, excuse me, at Wittenberg University now. She will be talking about St. Cuthbert's Way and really good speaker, part walk story, part cultural history of St. Cuthbert's Way in England and Scotland. That'll also be here and that will be on February 20th. Plenty of uh, cards out there, please grab one. So thank you everybody for coming tonight for Justin. Justin, we finally got you down here to uh, talk. Actually, we got you back in <laughs> Springboro. Anybody remember Cyclones Gansari? Used to be here in Springboro. Justin worked there. And yeah. uh, I am not going to do a big introduction, but we're really happy to have Justin here from K&G. Yeah. Um, 16 Dan. years there. And uh, having you here to talk about bike repair and also the value added of a bike shop and, and also um, what we need to do as we get our bikes ready for the uh, spring riding season here. So yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? This whole series is pretty great. Thanks, Springboro, for uh, bringing me back. A little, uh, little uh, introduction on me. I'm Justin. I'm the owner of Kanji Bike Center. A little history. I've been working on bikes for about 25 years now. I started out uh, in the 90s at a small shop, then uh, came out here to Springboro working at Cycles Gansari. We started a brand out of it, Gansari Bikes, also Skid Strong Bikes. We got sued by Lance Armstrong. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, <laughs> had to shut it down because uh, he didn't like our name. But uh, after they moved to California, started at K&G and worked my way up to actually owning the place. Uh, so uh, that's pretty amazing stuff. Um, I started off mountain biking, then I moved into uh, fixed gear racing, uh, raced in New York, alley cats, messenger races, was a semi-pro bike polo. Uh, player out there, yeah, bike polo, polo is a real thing, so it's pretty fun. Uh, now I'm strictly uh, road racing, so uh, it's pretty awesome stuff. So a uh, little history about K&G. K&G started in 1973, been around for a while now. Started by a guy named Doug Kramer, who was actually a, a quad. He was in a wheelchair since he was 18 years old, and he ran a bike shop out of a wheelchair, which is pretty amazing. Uh, he started off just helping the community, wanting to build something better, wanting to build something that took care of kids, took care of families, uh, was called the godfather of BMX, was one of the main people that brought BMX to this area. So he's actually seen as one of the founding fathers of that. Also brought a, a light to the need of wheelchair work and how expensive it is in the medical industry and how bike shops take care of wheelchairs and uh, special needs things all the time. So going into it, why do we need bike shops in the community? It's number one, yeah, we need a place to take our bikes to get worked on. We need a knowledgeable place that we can get fit on bikes. We need a knowledgeable place 
to find the right product. And that's all, they're there for that. But they also bring a community where they do a ton of charity work. They show up early in the morning for these charity rides to work on people's bikes. They help support all these organizations. They also work on all these random things that come in my store. I've worked on weed whackers. I don't know how to work on a weed whacker, but I work on them. Uh, golf carts. <laughs> we work on all sorts of things, but wheelchairs was the main thing that we wanted to, to help out with. It's about weekly I get a wheelchair in my store that goes, uh, this, the actual medical supply place, they want to charge me $100 for this, or they told me I need a new wheelchair. And we pull it out, we fix it, and give it back to them, and it really, really helps community with, with you know, helping people that need help with that, not overcharging and not trying to take advantage of their situation. So it, it's been, an, been kind of a goal of me and K&G to keep that going after Doug had passed a few years ago. So a couple things why, you know, and if you know anybody that has wheelchair work, bring it to the bike shop. It's a lot cheaper, I promise you that for sure. So uh, now we'll rock into some uh, bike maintenance stuff. So. When you start off with bike maintenance and start off, you need to start with a routine. You need a spring routine, you need a, a winter routine when you get your bike out for the year, when you put it away, but also you need a routine for when you start off and you're going to for, go for a ride and then when you come back to the ride. So get in a habit of doing the same thing and doing kind of a, a checklist of things you need to do. You can start with something called the ABCs. The ABCs is air, brakes, and chain three main things we want to make sure for safety reason. First thing, proper air pressure. You want to make sure you inflate the tires before you ride every time. You want to make sure you've got proper inflation or else you'll get more flats, you'll have a tougher ride, and you'll have more issues. So before you start, always just walk up to the bike. You want to squeeze it, make sure, it's, make sure you've got air in it. You might have gotten a flat from last ride, so we'll deal with that later, but you want to make sure you uh, can check the side of the tire, and it'll tell you the actual inflation, minimum to maximum, and you want to uh, pump it up to about close to the max for most people. If you have any questions on that, go to the bike shop. We can talk uh, tire pressure all day long. Uh, <laughs> some people like to go low, some high, but uh, depending on the, the tire, most people are gonna be close to the max. We wanna, wanna make sure you have it up there just to make sure you have a, a good ride and you don't get a lot of flats. Uh, Another thing while you're down there and you're looking at the, the tires and making sure, you can also check your quick release levers. There's these little levers on bikes that let, it, let the wheel just drop out super fast and easy. If those are loose, they can fall off while you're riding. We don't want that. So while you're here checking this out, you want to check that, make sure all of those are tight. There's, one in the, there's usually one in the front and one in the rear. So you want to make sure of that. Next, we go to brakes. We want to make sure those work properly, right? That way you don't, you don't uh, get in a situation where you can't stop. So first things first, pick up the tire, spin it, and hit the brake. Does it stop? That's your first thing. Pretty easy, right, guys? Yes. yes. Yeah, there we go. We, yes. got, we got some people talking. All right, all right, wake up, guys. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you want to make sure that the lever doesn't go all the way to the handle. You want to make sure you have a nice squeeze on the lever. It's not locked up. Just make sure it's functioning properly. So the third thing on your start checklist will be your chain. And it's a little harder for some people because it, it's a little more involved and people are scared of the chain because it drives the bike, but it's really easy. You just want to make sure when you pedal the bike, it spins freely, doesn't have crazy noise in it. Uh, you can shift it up and make sure all the gears work. You can put it up against the wall, pedal backwards a little bit, and you just want to make sure it's running freely. That's, a, that's the main thing. Those are your three first main steps to making sure your ride's going to work. And you can do it very quickly before you ride, and that'll make sure that you're safe and have a better ride through it all. Now, maybe a weekly checklist, monthly checklist would be checking some bolts, making sure everything's tight on the bike as you go. So you, you, you know how to do your like daily, just make sure it's all good. But every once in a while, you might want to check a couple of these bolts, your stem, has bolts on it, your, the, the top part of your stem, the, the people call the gooseneck, your seat, your pedals, they all have bolts on it. So every once in a while you might want to just take your, uh, take your hex wrench and just make sure they're tight. 
just go through a couple of them, just make sure they're all tight. An easy way to tell if you have some loose bolts, though, is if you pick up your bike and it rattles really badly, see how we're not hearing any rattling? If you hear a big rattle, something's loose. Something's not right. It could be a hub loose. It could be something loose. But that's your easy way. I tell people all the time, pick up a bike, drop it. If it rattles, find it. And then you can grab things on the bike, see if they're not, not holding straight, not, not tight. And that's a good way for a safety check. You might want to do that every, every week if you're riding a lot, every month if you're not riding a ton, just to make sure your bike's still going to ride smooth and proper for you guys. Some bikes, and I know a lot of you guys have these bikes because I know a lot of you guys, they have torque specs. Torque specs are important, especially on carbon. They're there for a reason. And they're, they're proper on aluminum too. Like you uh, want to make sure if it has a little code on it somewhere, it'll have, like this one says, 18 Newton meters. You want to make sure we don't go past that, but we want to make sure we hit close to that. Uh, if you, if you over tighten things on carbon, it can crack. Uh, on aluminum, you can stretch the aluminum out too far to where it'll start not being able to hold tight anymore. So make sure that if you have, especially if you have a carbon bike, we check torque specs, get a torque wrench, properly torque the, the items, but also on aluminum items too. Over torquing can strip and uh, destroy the product, which then as you're riding, it can break on you. So make sure you take care of that. So, the, one, of the most, the, one of the biggest questions I get asked in the shop is cleaning and lubing the chain. There's a lot out there about this and a lot of information about this. And it's not just a simple, this is how we do it, because everyone's different. If you're riding in inclement weather, dirt, you're going to need to lube it a little bit differently if you're riding just on the road, bike path, it's a little a little different, but we'll go over a couple of things and simply how to lube the chain and a couple different lubes and lube styles, just so you guys know. Uh, maybe you can find out what's good for you. And if you have any more questions, come talk to me, go to the bike shop, they'll get the proper lube that you need. There's hundreds of different ones out there. So uh, we're gonna talk about three main lubes. We're gonna talk about a dry lube, a wet lube, and then a wax. So a dry lube, is thinner, it's lighter, it's gonna have less friction on it, it is going to grab less dirt, it's cleaner, but it doesn't last as long. So you have to lube your chain a lot more when you use a actual dry lube than when you use a wet lube or a wax. A lot of racers use this, a lot of people that are just riding a road and not in, in wet weather, they'll use a dry lube because you get the most out of the chain with this. It's going to be less friction, it's going to be smoother, it's going to be faster, and we all want to be faster, right? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a wet lube is used for the majority of commuters, mountain bikers, anyone that's riding in bad weather. It lasts longer. It's going to protect your drivetrain, it's going to protect your chain longer, but it does grab more dirt, so it's a dirtier lube. So you've had to clean your chain more if you're in the in the dirt if you're in the bad weather, but it's going to last longer and protect you more. It is a little bit, it slows down your drivetrain just a little bit, so if you are worried about those extra watts, maybe the dry lube and lubing more, but have the option. And lastly is waxes. And waxes are great because they coat the chain and they don't collect dirt. But to truly put a wax on your bike, it's a lot more effort. Most of the time you have to pull the chain completely clean it in an ultrasonic cleaner or in some sort of cleaner, and then you melt wax onto the chain. It lasts a long time, but it is a lot more, lot more work, but that's another option, so. I'll show you guys how to lube a chain first, because everyone's wondering, now that I know what kind of lube I want, let's, let's figure out how to do this. First thing you do when you lube a chain, you actually clean the chain. My favorite drivetrain cleaner is this from Muckoff. You can get it on um, any bike shop any, out there. It's probably one of the strongest cleaners as well, so don't get it on anything you don't want to, uh, to clean. And no paint, no, uh, 
no carpet, this will mess it up pretty good. But you, you spray a rag with the cleaner, and with your bike leaning up right up against the wall, you can actually pedal the bike, pedal the, wheel, pedal the uh, chain backwards, and you just hold that rag on like this, and just pedal backwards. Just getting as much of the dirt off as you can. And you want to do this at least once a week. You just keep cleaning it, make sure you get it as clean as you can. If it's really dirty, you might have to get a brush and get it into these uh, cassette gears, but uh, that's the main thing. And as you, less is more in lubes. So you don't want to over lube. So as you're doing it, you're basically just going to drop a single drop on the roller on the inside of that chain. Go slowly and just single drop all the way through. You don't need to lube the outside of the chain as much because the inside is what's actually rolling. So you slowly do every single one of these rollers. And with a wax, and with a, a wet wax, you would let it sit for a second. And then a chain like that, you uh, can just kind of pedal it through. And then you grab a rag and you pull all that excess off. That excess will attract dirt. And we don't want it. As, the l less dirt, the better for a, for a nice running drivetrain. And while you're down here doing the chain, I suggest you lube your pulley wheels right here and right there, because those will cause friction in your drivetrain and make it not ride as well. So make sure you uh, lube those as well. Any questions on lubing chains? And Oh, and it's dry? Oh. Well, I mean, a dry chain is, is, is what it sounds, that's what I was going to do. That's what it sounds like. I mean, you can, you, can, you can physically see lube on a chain. You can see that it is, is wet, there's a little glisten in the light, and when it's dry, it almost looks corroded and rusted almost. It's, and you can see that it's just metal on metal. And when you pedal it, you get this horrible just squeal. It just squeals the whole time. If, if you ever hear someone riding down the bike path, you're <laughs> carry a bottle of lube with you and lube it up for them. <laughs> they don't know about it. So, and that is, uh, if you hear that noise, make sure you're lubing. And sometimes it's your pulley wheels that are so dry as well. That's why you want to hit those as, as well. But you, want, you don't want a rusty chain, and you want to see that nice glisten on it of lube, or else you're going to have problems. It's going to wear the drivetrain quicker. You're going to have to buy a cassette quicker. You're going to have to buy chain rings quicker. And you're going to have to see me more. And I know you guys like to see me, but you don't like to spend the money when you see me. So if you lube the chain, it'll, be, it'll cost you less. So keep it all, keep it all lubed up and clean. Um, a clean bike's a happy bike, right? You know, it's, it's, it's true, it's, uh, it runs better, it runs smoother, it, it's quiet. We all like a quiet bike. So, yeah, that's the main, I always tell people if they clean and lube their bike more, they'd, they'd spend a lot less in my shop on repair, so, uh, yeah. How many more miles or how many more miles can you get out of a wax chain versus any of the lube? Out of a wax chain? So, it depends on the wax. But I have seen that the, like the Silka one, the Silka wax, which is what I like to use, I've seen it go a couple thousand more miles. And when you get past that, it, the, chain, the cassette isn't destroyed, which is the key. Chains are cheap, cassettes are expensive, so yeah. Uh, waxing, it takes a lot more effort, but what I use a lot of times is this wet wax. And wet wax doesn't last as long as your normal lube and, and actually baking wax onto a chain. So I uh, have to apply this about twice as much as a normal lube, I'd say. But you can actually feel the drivetrain free up and it protects it more. So it's worth it to me to, to have to lube my chain more but uh, spend less money in the end. So. Any more questions on that? No? We all, we're all ready to lube our bikes? All right. All right.
basic supplies you need for this stuff that I would suggest in your shop, in your uh, garage, your shop, or wherever you're working on it at is number one, rags and brushes for cleaning the bike. You've got your cleaning supplies. We like to use Simple Green foaming. It gets in the cracks. It's really nice stuff. A drivetrain cleaner to clean the chain. But you can get away with Simple Green to clean the chain. You can also get away with uh, Dawn dish soap and water. That's a great. Uh, it, it kills the grease on our on our pans. So why can't it on our bike, right? And it's a uh, doesn't affect any paint or anything else, so it's also a good one. Uh, you want uh, a nice chain lube, and then a nice small set of tools is good to have. You know, you want to have a nice hex wrench set that you can actually check the bolts out, and and a bike shop can get you taken care of for that. If you want to get really into it, you can get a bike stand. They're really nice. As you see, it's really easy to work on it, to spin wheels, so it's a nice, if you're cleaning your bike a lot, it is a nice investment. There's different ones, there's floor mounts, there's ones that are on the wall, it's, it's just really nice to have. One thing I want to go over, because everything now is coming up with disc brakes. How many people have disc brakes on their bikes? That's half the crowd right there, yeah. One thing, don't touch the rotor with your hands. The oils from your hands can embed in the rotor, which can then uh, make it squeal. When you're working with disc brakes, I was told by SRAM and Shimano how to clean disc brakes is just with a dry rag. They say don't use anything. Now what we've, we've talked to them about is, well, you can't just say that. We need something we can clean with it. So isopropyl alcohol. So clean disc brakes with the rotor and the pad. You can wipe down with isopropyl alcohol and it won't affect it. But any other cleaners, if a lube gets on it, certain cleaners, they bed into the pad itself. And the nature of disc brakes is the pad material beds itself into the rotor, and that's actually what you're stopping on. That's what gives it the power. And if you get lube or some sort of material, like a, some sort of solvent or anything in the actual pad itself, it heats up as you're stopping, which creates air pockets, which then make it shimmy, and that's where the noise is. It's not causing you not to stop, but it will cause that pad to do a micro shimmy, which causes a squeal or something called like a, it sounds like a turkey gobble. That's what we call it in the shop. If you have a turkey gobble and it's one of the most annoying things, your brakes will still work, but to get rid of it, we either have to sand your pads and light them on fire and hopefully burn the, burn it out. Yes. Which is, which is a little nerve wracking in the shop to see flames, but we do it to see if we can burn that, uh, that oil out of there or you have to replace both pads and rotors, which can get expensive. So make sure when you're cleaning, uh, I've had a lot of people come in my shop tell me they uh, lubed the rotors because it was making noise. <laughs> they put chain lube on it because they thought I was rubbing it. Yes, that's new pads and rotors. So make sure uh, alcohol is the only thing we touch on those disc brakes. So I wanna make sure we talk about that. Um, we'll go, we'll do the flat tire later. I wanna go over I want to go over e-bikes with you guys because that's what that main thing I get talked about lately is e-bikes. So, and I don't know how many people in here are going to get e-bikes soon, but I feel like you guys are ready for e-bikes. A lot of you guys, <laughs> especially in this row right here. I think you guys are ready for the e-bikes. So, yeah, right here, right here. So, e-bikes, we'll start with, there's three types of e-bikes out there. There's three categories out there. One, two, and three. Super easy, right? Category one is a 20 mile per hour e-bike, pedal assist only. It's what most people should, should be riding. Class two is a throttle, 20 mile per hour. It can't go past 20 mile per hour, but it still has an th actual throttle that you can ride, so you don't have to pedal. And then there's class three. Class three has the most laws on it, but class three is a 28 mile per hour bike. It cannot have a throttle. And it has to, uh, it has to stop at 20 miles per hour with uh, pedaling. Um, and the laws on the 20 mile per hour ones, we'll start with that. You have to be 16 years or older to ride a, 20, to ride a ca uh, category three. You have to have a helmet on, it's actually law. It's, it's one of the only bicycle laws where you have to have a helmet on a, on a class three e-bike. Um, you cannot tamper with the motor on it to make it go any faster, that is illegal. And uh, you cannot ride on bike paths on a class three. It's only allowed on the road. So those are your, those are your main laws on the uh, 
the class three. Class one and two are actually allowed on bikeways unless otherwise noted. Some cities will not let them on at all, but most bike paths you can ride a, a class one and a two, which is a 20 mile per hour bike on it. Um, everyone can ride those bikes as well. There's not an age limit on them. And uh, so they're the, the least laws on the one and two and the three has the most, which should be. Uh, little uh, little uh, information on e-bikes and on maintenance, because there's a lot more involved on e-bikes than there is on a normal bike. They're heavy. You know, e-bikes, the, the lightest ones I've seen are 35 pounds, but most of them are 50 to 60 pounds. So that means they take a lot more abuse, because you can't pick the bike up when you hit bumps. You can't pick it up when you go over you know, a curb. So they're, hit, they're taking more hits, which is then causing things to have more issues. So number one, make sure those tires are aired up on, a, on an e-bike, for sure. You will have a lot more issues, a lot more flats if they're not pressured. You want to make sure that the spokes are tight and everything, and the handlebars are tight and all the bolts are tight on those. They're taking a lot more vibration and things loosen up faster. So they take a little bit more repair work and a little more, um, your tune-ups come a little faster on those. You want to check your firmware as well. Yeah, talking firmware on bikes, it's crazy. Was, <laughs> first it was DI2 shifting and now it's e-bikes. So, but firmware on these, you want to make sure you check them. Some you can do from your app on your phone. Some you have to take into the shop. So uh, you want to make sure the firmware is up to date because it will cause less issues and you'll have less motor problems and it can tell us what's going on inside that. If you bring it to the shop, we can sell if we've had any voltage errors, anything going on to where we can address it before you're out on the road about to pedal in front of a car and then it breaks down and then you get hit. So we don't want that. So make sure you're always checking on the uh, firmware. You always want to leave the battery, if you're storing it over for a long, long period of time, between 30 and 60% life. It's a little harder to, to reach that point. You never want to store a lithium ion with a dead battery. If it's fully discharged, that'll kill the battery. And you really don't want to have it at full. And this is with all lithium ion batteries. So if you want to talk about axis shifting batteries and all that stuff too, if you're not going to use them for a while, 30 to 60% is where it'll keep the battery's life for a lot longer. So you want to make sure you, you are keeping it in a good temperature, cold will destroy the battery. Uh, so if you're leaving it, let's say for the winter, I'm done riding, it's cold, it's negative 33 degrees outside, why would I ever want to ride in this? Bring the battery inside. That will keep it, keep the lifespan of it. So you don't have to buy one in the next two years, it'll be six years before I have to buy one because they are quite expensive to replace. So uh, any questions on e-bikes? No? We all, we're all not there yet. OK, good, good. We're all pedaling at our own. All right. Well, you get there, especially this row right here. Uh, how about different kind of drives for the e-bike? Can you get the hub drive versus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. There are two main motor types on e-bikes. There is the hub drive, uh, which uh, powers, the, it powers the bike from the actual rear wheel. So it, it, this is actually where you drive and it's actually pushing the motor and the chain and going. And then you've got your mid drive, like this one right here, where all of the power is coming from your cranks. The rear hub drive takes a lot more torque and a lot more wattage to run the bike. Now 750 watts is the max legal in Ohio to have on the, on the uh, motor of a bike. You have to run on a class, class one and two, three to 500 watts, and on a class one, five to 750 watts, so it doesn't burn out and you get enough torque to run the bike. So you have to have a, a big motor, which is draining a lot of that battery on it. And it puts a little more stress on the drivetrain on a rear motor bike. The mid-drive, these run about a 250 watt motor on them up to 350 watt motor. You get more torque than you do on the rear and less stress on the drivetrain. So you're running the battery less with less torque and less power. So power saved is good because you're gonna need it when you hit that headwind going 
going back home. So mid drive is usually seen as the better motor system, but most mid drives don't have throttles. So if, you, if you're looking for a class two, you're looking more at a, a rear hub drive. So there is actually a really good source, Bosch Motors, it's the, probably the number one e-bike motor out there is Bosch. They have an actual range finder that you can actually put in a bunch of different parameters and it'll tell you kind of the range of the motors and everything. It's a good source to, to go through. So. Justin, obviously those are nice for climbing. Mm -hmm. Because they're so much heavier, what about descending? Descending? And is the braking system different or just mm -hmm. the disc brakes? It is disc brakes. They have they have e-bike specific tires, brake pads, chains for the torque and for the added weight of descending. Uh, so it is a little bit nicer braking system, but not that much different than what you are used to. Uh, descending is a little bit slower. We all, I don't know we all have, but a lot of us have ridden with some people with e-bikes and once it hits a certain point and it, the motor cuts off, it, it's a struggle to keep it going. So it's better on hills, but downhill, you do slow down a little bit. On flats, um, it, it, once you hit that 20 mile per hour or 28 mile per hour, it, it is a little bit harder to pedal. So, but how many of us are riding over 20 miles per hour? Nobody? Not a single person? <laughs> See, okay, so, so that's good. All right. Any more questions on e-bikes? Just one more thing. Yeah. So there is a few bikes out there. Candel makes one called the Treadwell. Uh, Giant makes one well, it, called a Momentum. And they're a little lighter. They're about 35 pounds to 40 pounds. And they're right at the limit of a normal bike path. I mean, a bike rack. Now, they still say that they should be on an e-bike specific rack. But I've gotten away with it on those. Uh, but everything else has to be done on a hitch style e-bike specific rack to carry it. So. All right. Now the fun. What we've all been waiting for, how to change a flat tire. So. First thing in changing a flat tire. Well, I guess we'll start with this. How many of you are familiar with Presta valves? Half the room? OK, good. So we'll talk about the two main styles of, of valves real quick. So most of us are familiar with what's called a Schrader valve. It's what's in our car. It's what's common in a lot of the American stuff. A lot of our higher end bikes have something called a Presta valve. It's actually a French valve. It's a little thin guy like this. So when you see this, a lot of people get confused. Super easy to use. There's a little knob on top. We just twist it out. It opens the valve up and you can put air in. You do have to have a, a press a valve pump or an adapter like this. You can thread right on there and turns it basically into a Schrader valve. So. so when you're on the road and you get a flat, you're like, what do I do? Well, hopefully you went to your bike shop and was like, hey, I'm gonna get a flat at some point. I need an emergency kit. And there's two main ways of actually inflating a tire if you get one on the road. There is a small little pump like this. It just bolts right onto your bike right here on your water bottle. And once you change your flat, you can actually put air into it. Because we always get flats, it seems like, when it's 90 degrees, it's black top, you're, you're roasting, and there's nothing around you. So you got to carry this or CO2. This is easier. This right here, you'll be pumping up for a while. It's, it's cheaper, because you don't, it's just your energy, but you just sit there and pump and pump and pump. Where CO2 has a little CO2 inflator, you put it on the tire, you press the button, and it shoots air into it. There's a whole other learning curve to this. If you ever want to talk about these, we can, but most people carry a nice CO2 inflator in case they have an issue on the trail. A couple other things I would suggest to carry is a patch kit and a tire boot. A tire boot is something that not a lot of people have heard about. This right here is if you get a large cut in your tire, you can actually put it in there 
and it keeps the tube from going through so you can still go home. You can also use a dollar bill, a piece of cardboard, a wrapper from your, your bar you just ate, but the boot is a little stronger, so if it's got a big cut, it's good, because every, every once in a while you get a large cut in there, and you put a new tube in, it's just gonna blow out again, so. If you have tubeless, you should be carrying this. These are tire plugs. Same thing as it's in your car, if you ever got a nail in your car and you plug it, this is the same thing on a smaller level. On tubeless, if you see you've got a hole and it's not sealing from the sealant that's inside it, you can grab this out, put one in there, and plug the hole, and hopefully keep riding. Because we all know the mess it is when you have to remove all the sealant out of a tubeless tire, so hopefully that does it, so. All right. Everyone got their wheels ready? Are we, gonna, are we all gonna change the flat with me or just watch? I see a bunch of wheels out there. All right. <laughs> They're nervous. First thing, everyone always asks, well, what if it's on the rear of the bike? What am I gonna do? First thing we wanna do is we wanna put it right down to the last gear. It's easier. It doesn't really matter what gear it's in, but it just makes it easier for removing the wheel. We have a quick release wheel right here. You undo the lever of the quick release, spin it out a little bit, and let the wheel fall right out. And we're going to move that derailleur right out of the way right there, and it just pops right out. It's that easy, right? You guys have done it, right, everyone? It's that easy. It's that easy on the road. <laughs> you know, I've hung it in trees. I, I refuse to work on the ground, so I'll find a tree or something to hang it off of, or someone will have to hold it up for me. Never a tree close. Never a tree close. <laughs> That's why you always got to ride with a friend. On disc brakes, hydraulic disc brakes, I should say, if you, are to, if you pull the wheel out and there's no rotor in there and you hit the brake, that, those pistons will close in on themselves as you hit the brake and can lock it up. So we always put a block in there to keep it from falling, to keep it from closing up in case you have a friend that thinks he's funny and comes over and likes to hit your brakes. So you kind of put it right there just for safety. Because if that thing, if those pistons close those pads on themselves, you get to come see me again. And we know you like to see me. We've talked about it. But that's an expensive one because we've got to re-bleed the brakes. So. so we're going to remove the air out of this. But if you're, probably, if you're doing this, you probably have a flat, so it's probably already out. A lot of air in there. Still going. Should've grabbed a smaller tire. Still going. Still, with that, with that little pump right there? <laughs> Never again. I was on a mountain bike trail on a 29er tire this big, and I blew my tire off, and me and one of my friends sat there and pumped that thing up, probably 30 minutes. We're just back and forth, one person's arm would get tired. So, CO2 now forever. Yeah. <laughs> so, your tire's flat, you got no air in it. First thing I suggest to do is to get the bead unseated out of the rim. And some tires are a little harder than others. This is gonna be a hard one, because it's, it's a tubeless. You slowly pull the tire to the middle. Slowly but surely. Wanted to bring a hard one for you guys. Yeah. Slowly bring it. We'll see if I can do it. It's locked in there. I get the question a lot of times because rims now are mainly tubeless and they're really hard to unseat the bead and to seat the bead on them. I get this question a lot, and the key to it all is getting it to the middle of the rim. Sometimes you gotta pull a tire lever out, peel it out there, but the key is to get it to the middle. Are those the same kind of tire levers that are out there right now? Probably, I didn't see what was out there, but more than likely. Did you guys hear that pop? That's that tubeless 
unseating from the side of the rim. And you just saw how much it took for me to do it, so imagine what your normal person does on the side of the road. It's not easy. I've had a lot of people come in mad that they couldn't get it to pop. I've had phone calls on the side of the road. But first key is to re unseat it all the way around to the middle. And then you go to the other side and you do the same thing. And then you're going to grab your tire lever right up underneath there and you're going to spin it all the way around. That allows, now allows you to get the actual bad tube out. So, we'll pretend like that's a bad tube. I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's a super deep indent in there. And that's on new rims now. All the rims have these super high walls, and they're really hard to actually seat in there. So that's the key, is getting that bead into that center channel. That center channel then relieves the side wall and allows it to actually go onto the rim. It gives a little bit more space. Once you get the tube out, you wanna, first thing first, check that tire. Make sure there's no hole in it, make sure you find why you got the flat. I mean, that's the key. Because if you put a tube in there and there's a, there's a nail or a piece of glass in there, you, uh, you're just going to have another flat. And we don't want that. I think we've all been with someone on a ride when they change the flat and then 10 feet later, 100 yards later, whatever, I got a flat again. And you're like, come on. So make sure you check. Easiest way to check is with your hands. But that is also the most painful way. Because when you hit that nail, it, it hurts. But you can, you know, you want to squeeze the tire. Make sure it's all cleaned out. You might find uh, other pieces of rock and glass that, you can, that haven't embedded all the way in that you can get out of the way and make sure it's good. And then you can take your tube, your new tube, pump it up. But you also want to take your old tube and pump it up and see where, if you can find where the hole was. Because that can also help you find why it went flat. Pinch flat. Pinch flat? So we'll talk about the three types of flats. Now they had that question. You've got a puncture on the top. That's pretty easy. That means something went through the tire and has punctured it. It could be a nail, could be thorn, anything. You've got the bottom. If you have a hole in the very bottom of it, it's usually a problem with what's called the rim strip. As you see, this is a yellow piece right in there. If you have a a double wall rim, you need to have a plastic or cloth one or rubber rim strip if it's a single wall rim. So you have something like this or like this in there. And if you have a hole in the bottom, that means there's a problem with that rim strip, whether it got a hole in it or it moved out of the way. And then the question is snake bite, pinch flat. A pinch flat is when you're riding along and you take a hit so hard because you didn't air up your tires. Uh, high enough because you didn't do your routine checklist because you didn't write down all the information when Justin was talking and now you're <laughs> just kicking yourself like man why did I do that so you hit a bump and when you hit a bump the tire actually pinches and there's nowhere for that tube to go other than in between the rim and the tire and it does something like a snake would do it puts two holes right there it pinches it just like that so and that those two little holes you can see, oh, now I got a pinch flat. And it's a little harder to actually uh, patch that if you have a problem because you have two holes now instead of one. So, so what do we want to do? We want to air up our tires properly, right, before we ride? Yes. Yeah, that's my number one thing today. So a lot of people carry an extra tube or you can carry patches. I've been on a ride where I've gotten four flats and ran out of extra tubes and patches. You can also use super glue and paper towels. Little secret. It'll get you home. So, I did it. Uh, I found a dollar store and, and did it one on one ride and rode another thirty miles on it. I probably could have kept riding on it, but I, I changed it too when I got home. I was a little nervous. All right. Once you found the once you found the hole, you found the uh, the piece of glass or whatever that caused it. You've got the new tube. You're ready to go in. Start with the valve. 
put it right there and start slowly pushing it into the tire. Once it's in the tire, you can start putting the bead on all the way. You just take your hands and you just slowly start pushing the bead on, making sure that you are tucking the tire in as so. And if you're blessed with a big belly like me, you can just hide it right up underneath there and it holds it like a table and it works perfectly. If you're not blessed with that, well, it's gonna be a little harder for you, sorry guys. So you slowly are pinching it in and you wanna keep pinching it towards the middle of that tire to that relief channel. A relief channel will save you 100% on that. And then you slowly just use your hands and pop it. It's that easy, guys, right? It's always been that easy. It's always that easy, right? Oh. Always, it's never harder. So, that's true. I actually was gonna bring my road bike, but these are harder. But some people can't do it with their hands. You wanna do it as much as possible with your hands. You really do. But if you can't, and you can't get that last bit, you can use a tire lever. You wanna make sure you are not touching that tube underneath there when you do it. And you can slowly bring that tire lever over set that bead in. So, <laughs> there's also a really cool tool right here. It's made by Cool Stop. And it's for uh, tires you can't pull over. I'm gonna unseat this tire another time. Just keep unseating it, it'll be fun. So I can show you that one. It actually, you hook it onto the bead over here and it actually gives you more leverage on grabbing the, the actual tire and it pulls out for you. Hmm. It'll help you with the hard tires. They do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They actually make them also that go in your pack as well. They help out a lot with the tubeless tires. Tubeless tires are so much harder to actually put on. So. But the goal is to be able to do it with your hands because if you use your hands, you're going to have less issues and you're, gonna, you're not going to pinch the tube with your tools. Once you're done with actually getting the tube in there, you want to check around the whole bead and make sure the tube didn't sneak up underneath there. Because there's been a lot of times when you put it up underneath, when you put the tire in, the tube in, it sneaks in, you pump it up and it'll just blow that, that tire right off and it sounds like a shotgun. So then we just uh, pump it up to proper inflation. And where, did, where, where do we find proper inflation numbers? Yeah, you guys are listening. Or maybe you already knew that. Tubeless tires sometimes will make a loud popping noise when they pump up. Sometimes they don't, so. I had one of you guys come use this uh, small emergency pump and see how it worked out. <laughs> Once you're done pumping it, see, there's the pop. There's the pop. I always take it and spin it. And if it hasn't set and the bead is too high or too low, you'll see it go up and down. And it'll let you catch the issue before you either try to ride it or it blows off the rim. So you always want to do that. Installing the tire back on, we'll remove that block out of there. You're going to just pull the chain back around, pull this derailleur out, and we just slowly bring it back in. Disc brakes are easy because you just put that rotor in between. You don't have to move them out of the way or anything. And then we twist them. Another good reason to have a big belly. Hold that tire in, see that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you asked. Not in the tire, but I have had it go through the whole derailleur before. Oh, wow. Yeah. When you were working on 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, one time I was racing and jumped off the bike, and when I jumped back on, I sat on the on it, and like pulled up. And it was like, and I thought to myself, I wonder how many people that's happened to. <laughs> so once you get your quick release tightened up, you want to make sure you flip that lever back over to make sure it's actually locked in place. If you have any questions about quick release, come see your shop. They'll get you taken care of. Now I did this on purpose. I put this gear not in the bottom gear to show you guys that it really doesn't matter that much because once you pedal it, it'll drop down to the gear it's supposed to be in. And then it's, it's changed. It's so easy, right guys? Okay. So this is a tubeless tire and a tubeless rim, but it's got a tube in it. So it can be run tubeless, but it's not set up tubeless. So, yeah, so, so you can run tubes in a tubeless tire, but if we wanted to make this true tubeless, we would tape the rim with a, with a um, special tape. You put sealant in it and you take the tube out and then you have to put an actual tubeless valve in and then it's tubeless, but it's, it's tubeless ready, I should say. It's not actually tubeless. So tubeless, there is, the advantage of tubeless is you can run lower pressure and not get pinch flats. You can't get pinch flats on the tubeless because there's no tube, right? Uh, you can run the lower pressure and you have, and it seals up small holes because there's sealant in there. So if you were to get a thorn in there, it usually seals up around it to where you get less flats. Now, there's a whole other game to tubeless, which, you know, it's messier when you try to change the tires. They're harder to change when you get there. And you have to add sealant in about every six months to eight months because it actually evaporates out or it can dry in there. So that's one thing a lot of people don't do is change their sealant out enough. So about every, every six months, I, su I suggest adding sealant in. I'm sorry? Rolling oh yeah, so I mean, most, most of the time tubeless has a, a less rolling resistance because it has a lighter on top. Um, but the, mo the majority of it is that low pressure, being able to grip the ground more and being able to keep contact. If you have too much air or like a lot of air in a tire, you can't keep contact. It, it micro vibrates over the actual pavement and it, you know, you're losing friction, so you got a lot less rolling resistance with tubeless. CO2 cartridges, mm -hmm. difference between a tubeless tire, a mountain bike, and a regular tube for the tire. Mm -hmm. So CO2 can work on tubeless and tubed, either one, it doesn't matter. But on road, it takes a certain size canister in mountain. So you want to match the size of your tire and how much air you want in it with the size, with the amount of CO2 you're running, whether it's 16 gram, 20 gram, or more. Sometimes you have to use two canisters depending on it, but yeah, you basically just match the, match the actual tire size with the amounts you're wanting to use. So just a mountain road, I get a flat, I realize I don't have a tube with me, I'm not riding this place, so I'll get an extra tube. Mm -hmm. You can try. <laughs> so what basically is asking, you know, and, 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 and talking about is you want to make sure the tube fits your bike. Number one, there's two, two parts that you want it to fit. The actual wheel size. You know, there's multiple different actual diameters, but also widths of tires. So you want to make sure the width and the diameter match. It, close enough. In emergency, you can put a you know, a 25 millimeter tube in a 23 millimeter tire, stuff like that. The other thing you want to, you want to watch is your actual valve size. There are different lengths of valves because different rims have different depths. So you want to make sure that you carry a spare tube that actually fits the depth of your rim. Because if you have a super deep rim, your buddy might have a short one and then you're still out of luck. So number one, Keep a tube with you for your bike. I always keep a longer, longer one with me that fits everybody's because you want to make sure you have it for everybody. So, yeah. Any other questions? I have a question about putting your chain on. Mm -hmm. I had an accident. My chain came off. Yeah. I was hurt. Somebody put my chain on. 
chain back on for me. So I, I wasn't really sure how, if I had to do that myself. Do I have to have my, my handle gears in a particular place? Or? You don't have to. And I also have the front gear on it. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if that makes a difference. Yeah, so. You, three, three gears in front and seven. Okay. Yeah, so most of the time it falls off in the front. That's the, the majority of the time it falls off up, up here. We'll pretend like you just fell off right there. So it doesn't have to be in a particular gear. You, you, the, if you take it down on your bike into one, it's easier, but it doesn't have to be there. The easy way to do it is you take this rear derailleur and you just push it, and it adds slack to this cable. As you see how, how much slack it adds. And you just grab it up there, and you slide it onto the gear. And then you pedal forward, and it'll go to the gear you need it. It's supposed to be into. Uh, sometimes it gets stuck. Sometimes it falls off, and we're like, "Hey, if I keep pedaling, it'll pop back on." <laughs> I don't know why we think that, but hey, it will happen. And it just shoves that chain up into that bottom bracket and locks it in. That is a little more difficult to get out. You can yank and pull, but you may have to remove the crank to get it out. So if your chain does fall off, stop pedaling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The derailleur will push it to wherever it's supposed to go, and you'll be fine and safe. Yeah, as long as you're pedaling forward. Pedaling backwards, if it's in the wrong gear, it will lock it up. So, pedal forward. Yeah. I don't change the subject. Mm -hmm. How often should you lubricate the axles? Are you talking the the hub bearings? The hub. Yeah. So, on an on an unsealed hub, greasing them, I would suggest. Every probably every three thousand miles, every two to three thousand miles, and keep them. It'll keep them good. Uh, sealed bearings last a little bit longer, and you can get six to ten thousand miles out of them. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. It doesn't happen as bad nowadays as it used to because tires are made a little bit better. But your tires can dry rot, especially in cold and out, out in the garage if we don't take care of them. I suggest lifting them up off the ground and keeping them aired up. That will keep them from dry rotting as, as fast. I bring my bikes inside so I don't see that as much. But if they're outside in a bad, you know, in a cold weather or in a shed or something, try to keep them up off the ground, up off the dirt and then also uh, keep them aired up. Yeah. Is that it? No more questions? Are we all ready to do flats? Oh, we got one back there. So I'm uh, mentioning bringing all these slides with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, where are you? Are you bringing a little backpack? So they make a small little pouch that will fit up underneath your seat, or they make a handlebar pouch. And you can put a CO2 canister, a tube, a couple tubes, tire levers, and everything you need inside it. It's a little emergency kit. Uh, and it just fits right up underneath the seat right there. It's nice to have. It's out of the way. You can usually fit keys or a credit card in there as well. So depending on how big, they make them to where you can put your clothes for a week in it too. <laughs> depending on how big you want to get it. But yeah, yeah, the, it's nice. Out of the way, a lot of people. The little emergency kits. They actually, a lot of a lot of shops have a a um, emergency kit you can buy that has the pouch, has the tools, and everything you need other than your tube that you can just throw in there. Yeah. All right. Are we all ready to do our own flats? I see wheels all over here, and no one's you, no one's doing it. So, no. Any more questions on maintenance or? Uh, I guess we'll talk about the uh, end of the season. Some of you guys don't have end of the season. Some of you guys ride all year long. But if you don't and you're not riding for the end of the year, the routine that I suggest to finish out the year, I'm, I'm not going to touch my bike for a while, I suggest pulling it up, taking the wheels off, doing a full cleaning of the frame, checking everything, making sure nothing's worn, You know, do a visual check lubing the chain, putting it back up, airing it up before you put it away for the year. You will do a visual check, make sure, you know, there's no issues. A lube chain isn't gonna, gonna have any issues in rust or <coughs> have any problems during the winter time as well. So just 
you know, when you're putting it up, just make sure you clean it. Don't put it away dirty for the year and then come back out in March or April and go, why is my bike all messed up? You know, <laughs> cause it, it, it will, it will hinder it. So, yeah. More questions? We good? Oh, we got another. Yeah. Do you suggest uh, once a year maintenance coming in for someone like you, or uh, just for you know, beginning of the spring or every other year? If you're riding, you know, a couple times a week, I suggest every year getting a tune-up just to make sure it's all good. If you're riding a ton of miles, uh, let's say five, six thousand miles a year, you may have to bring your bike in a couple times to get it worked on. Um, just you'll have more issues. So, but your normal rider every year is good to bring it in. Did you get a question? So when you were talking about flats, you talked about hanging it up or hanging it in the tree. Mm -hmm. Is it not okay to flip it over? You can flip it over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We a lot of people have flipped it over. I just. I'm so used to working in a stand that I, I will always do it. It's, it's backwards to me. When I have it upside down, it's all backwards. And I have, I have more trouble than if I hang it. So, <laughs> But yeah, you can, you can put it upside down. And what's nice about it being upside down, when you put the rear wheel in, it actually drops in and sits in. The gravity will actually put it to where it needs to be. So you usually get it in properly. Mm-hmm. You got two ways. You can get a really fancy rotor protector for cleaning and lubing your chain. Then they make it, it goes over. It's made by Muck Off. Um, or the key is less lube. Don't put a lot on there. And then having a rag there when you're pedaling backwards. And you should be fine. You shouldn't. But you can also, while you're, while you're actually lubing it, you could just wrap, wrap a rag around it, like a clean rag. At the shop, when we're working on a bike and we're cleaning it, we wrapped it around the brake pads just to protect it. So you could just take an old t-shirt, old rag, and do that, so. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's two different types. There is a spacer that just holds space. And there's actually a wedge style, which will actually open up the pads as well. I always use the wedge style because it does reset the pistons back in. So it allows movement in the piston. But when you start riding again, you will need to pump the brake a little bit to get the pad to where it needs to be. But on disc brakes, the nature of a disc brake is to self-adjust. So as the, as the pad gets worn, it slowly pulls itself in. So the piston sticks out quite a bit for a long period of time, can get corrosion, can get rust on it. So then it doesn't want to actually go back in as well. So that's why I like to reset those pistons every once in a while, bring them back in and out and get the movement going so they can get re-lubed up and not get stuck. So. All right, I think that's it. Oh. Oh, okay, uh, and SRAM once a year. Shimano, that's uh, per base. Uh, if you're doing a lot of hills and you're hitting the brakes a lot, once a year. That uh, mineral oil, the nature of so the, in, in disc brakes, there's two different types of fluid. There's dot fluid, which is kind of what's in your cars, and then there's mineral oil, which is just a fancy mineral oil that they put a, a couple additives in. The dot fluid, is collects air more. So you have to actually bleed it about once a year to make sure you still have good braking properties on it. But it can handle more heat, so you don't get any brake fade when you're going down mountains or hitting the brakes a lot. Mineral oil doesn't handle heat as well, but it lasts, it doesn't, doesn't attract the air as much, so it lasts a long time. So if you don't ride your bike for a year, you can get on it and you're not gonna have air that's present in the line. But if you're doing a lot of actual mountains and heating it up, that fluid turns black and you lose all the property on it and you get brake fade, which you don't want going down a mountain. All of a sudden your brakes to start going out. So make sure you, if you're doing a lot of that, you, you do it about once a year. It's crazy because mineral oil in Shimano's pink and I'll be flushing the lines and it'll be black as it comes out if you hit a lot of it. 
So there's special rotors and special brake pads for dissipating heat, but it, it doesn't do as much as dot fluid. So, but dot fluid is more corrosive, harder to work with, and it, it pulls air in more. So kind of get, kind of pick, pick which one you want to deal with. They both have their problems, so. SRAM uses DOT, Hayes uses DOT, HOPE uses DOT as well. Those are your main three. And then most everyone uses mineral oil after that. So you, you normally don't see a DOT fluid on an inexpensive bike. They're more on a bike where people are using it a lot, so they're not going to sit. If, a bike, if it's on a, like a lower end bike or a, a hybrid and kids bike, a lot of times it's going to be mineral oil because they know that bike could sit for six months and they want to make sure that it can, that you just don't have to bleed your brake all of a sudden. So, yeah. So I go home and I, I thank you for all this. And I go look at my bike and I see if my cable's there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cable wear. So one thing, you can check the outside of the cable and make sure there's no cracking, no breaking. They like to split where there's movement, where, the, where it wraps around right here. You'll see some crumbling and, and breaking. Also, if it's not, if you see corrosion on the actual steel cable, this has internal so you won't see it, but if you have external, you can see actual corrosion, or if you feel you hit the brake, and it feels rough and not smooth, then come see me, we'll get them changed out. You can also lube your cables. That's a little more advanced for some people, but lubing your cables in a non-internal cable, you can actually pull the cable out a little bit and, and push a little bit of chain lube into where it hits the housing. The housing is your, is your black piece right here. Sometimes it's white, sometimes it's different colors. And then you have an inner cable that you can see right here, the silver right there. Some, sometimes they will uh, get corrosion right where they meet, and you can actually lube where they meet up. This is kind of a bad example, but most new bikes have internal to help keep from the, that happening. But if you have a, a bike that has external, you can just you know, lube where they're meeting, and it'll help prolong your cables. Shimano Road, the new Shimano Road 11 speed, uh, Altegra 105 Endures, replace your shift cables once a year. They like to break on you. I don't know why, they just like to break. So that's the way they route through it, you, they will break and that way you, uh, it's not on a ride when you break because it drops to the hardest gear and you have a really fun ride home. So preemptively bring it in, get those cables once a year. So. So you can spray it with a hose. You don't want a lot of pressure. Pressure will cause uh, grease to get pushed out of bearings and everything else, but you can, with a normal hose, spray it off first and then wipe it down, yeah. You want to make sure you wipe it down really good because that standing water will cause you know, corrosion and rust, but yeah, we've been known to, to wash with a hose if it's really dirty. So. If you bring your bike into us and it's super muddy, we'll hit it with a hose. So, all right, we ready for doing our, our flats? Yeah. All right, let's do it. <laughs> I think that's it. Yep. All right. Thanks for coming out, guys. I appreciate yep. it. If you have any more questions. I'm at the shop, KG Bike Center. Come see me, come talk to me, or go to your local bike shop. So. Thank you.